On today's show, Steve Trevor will try new Coke. John Cena and Jackie Chan are teaming up, and I will give my life and the life of all of my loved ones if that goddamn elephant can meet his mom again. <laughs> Movie talk starts right now. Oh, my goodness. Dumbo teaser trailer. Did you guys... We're going to talk about the Dumbo teaser trailer. The Nun also had a trailer drop this morning. We're going to talk about that tomorrow because if there's one movie that I cannot watch in 2019, it's got to be Dumbo. Like, I literally cannot process the tears that are going to be happening. I almost cried watching the trailer this morning. I got welled up a number of times. Let's just, the cat's out of the bag. Okay, no, we're not going to go to Dumbo yet. We'll get to the Dumbo trailer. But first, we have some more important breaking news. And before we get to that, I want to introduce everybody. That is Perry Nemiroff. That is Jeff Snyder, both of whom I'm very excited to have on the table, one of whom was a little under the weather earlier this week. But Perry Nemiroff, you, if there's one person that I would rely on to get back on your feet quickly it would be you the crossfit expert i i appreciate the confidence you have in me clearly something still sounds a little off but i don't like not working and i like having a job that i don't like missing i uh perry told me that that her doctor's orders were to do nothing the last two days and i said that sounds great and perry just can't do you can't do nothing no, it's, it's not possible, and I was busy hovering over the YouTube channel and working on the, some things I've got brewing on Collider.com, Ooh. so I actually, you know, I stayed home sick yesterday, and I had a pretty good day. Well, it was courtesy of Collider.com where I was able to see the first official images released for Wonder Woman 1984, Wonder Woman 2. Patty Jenkins herself, as well as Chris Pine, Gal Gadot, they're all coming back for Wonder Woman 2. And apparently they're very excited because Chris Pine did appear in one of the images and it's Steve Trevor at a shopping mall and it's a classic 80s shot. Look at that. That is that is exactly what malls looked like in the 80s, if I remember correctly. So the I, I do like the other image that we saw of Wonder Woman and she's looking at all these TVs and it felt very like 1980s, almost like a newsroom where you get a shot of JR from Dallas so you know what time period you're in. But let's get to the big thing. Steve Trevor is alive. He, I, I saw the first Wonder Woman movie. Jeff, I might be mistaken. I'm pretty sure he was in a plane that blew up in the end of the first one. So how is Steve Trevor going to make it from there and a different time period into a Cinnabon? Was there a body mark? Was there a body? I did not see a body. I saw tears from Wonder Woman. Listen, even if there was a body, this is the DCEU we're talking about. They can resurrect anybody using, I don't know, boxes, magic boxes, all Sounds kinds like of crazy somebody's stuff. somebody's bringing a magic box on the highway outside. So, uh, yeah, I actually reported this back in March. Whew, I'm going to whip out the phone. Uh-oh, here comes Guys, the phone, ladies and gentlemen. back in March, over at the tracking board, headline, Pedro Pascal joins Wonder Woman 2, so what's his role? And is Chris Pine coming back? <laughs> and in that, I suggested, yeah, the, the, guy, the guy's reps were being very cagey about his summer plans. Uh, I definitely heard that uh, he was gearing up to return, and, and now we have official proof. Okay. So I, I don't know how they explain it. That's sort of That'll be part of the fun of watching the movie. I'm glad that he's back. A lot of people will be upset, saying, you know, his death felt earned, you know, th- there was real emotion behind that death, and this kind of invalidates it. But you know what? I'm all for it. Okay, you're all for it. But Perry, my question is: Does this? What does the fact that they release the image is very interesting to me as well? That this is going to be more than just oh no, he's still he's still around and walking around, or this isn't like his grandkid. This is Steve Trevor, and if they release an image this early that he's in, you would think he's going to factor heavily into the plot of this movie as well. That's actually what's giving me hope with this whole idea because I am. I'm one of those people who, when I first heard about the possibility of Chris Pine coming back for this movie, no, 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 that was one of my favorite elements. Obviously, I didn't want him to die because I liked the character. I really liked their chemistry and relationship, but that moment was so well-earned, and especially in the midst of a third act that, to me, completely dipped in quality compared to the first two-thirds of the movie. So I wanted all of that to stay intact. I wanted them to uphold the emotional value of it. Plus, I think there's certain things we've seen and heard in BVS and Justice League that suggest that Wonder Woman is still reeling from the loss of her loved ones. So I don't want to take away from any of that. But the fact that... They're releasing this image right now makes me think that 
and also Patty Jenkins. I trust Patty Jenkins, her, her storytelling, uh, her creativity. I think she wouldn't bring him back unless she had a good reason. And the fact that one of the first official things we're seeing from this movie is an image of him makes me think that there's a lot more than, oh, hey, he survived. He's back. There's something there that's worthwhile. Okay, so how does he survive? How does he do it? Perry mentioned uh, when I got to the studio this morning. So I woke up, and and Mark Riley, as I usually wake up to a lovely text from Riley, and he said, hey, we got Wonder Woman, two images. Chris Pine is there. Steve Trevor's back. And I said, I don't want to do it on Movie Talk because I don't like talking about unofficial images. And he's like, no, this was actually released by the studio. So that's interesting. And then Perry and I started talking about how could we possibly get Chris Pine in this movie? Was it because, Jeff Snyder, we didn't see a body, or is it because there's somebody else in the DC universe who has the ability to turn back time like Cher. Maybe it's that. Maybe he threw the ejector seat and he popped out of the plane and Superman swooped in and saved his life but said, Steve Trevor, <laughs> don't tell anybody. Like, I, 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 don't, I have no idea. And that's the fun of going to the movies. Um, I don't want to know everything. If you're a real fan, I don't know why you guys would want to know everything. Uh, he's back. Isn't that enough? No, we got to know how it <laughs> happened, Perry. What happened? All Did right. Dumbo save him? So... Even though I like surprises, I have this terrible habit of going into the the black hole of Rumorville and reading about every possibility (laughs) out there. And I read one that suggests that, oh, maybe Steve Trevor had a kid who happens to look exactly like him. What do you mean had a kid? That that kid had a kid. (laughs) Happened to have had a kid before the events. With who? I, I don't know the answers to these things, but... When I take that idea into account and I look at that image, to me, I look at that image and I see almost like a Captain America style, like, oh, I was in that time period and now I'm here with all these weird 80 things. Could it be a dream sequence? Could it be something like that? Oh, you Could mean it be like a, JR? She's a, looking at a hallucination or something? I don't know. She's looking at an episode of Dallas. Maybe that's the Dallas episode where Patrick Duffy dies, but then he comes out of the shower. Look, here's the real question about this. Does it take <laughs> away, if Steve Trevor's alive, however he is still alive, does it take away the emotional toll like you brought up of the first movie? Because I thought that was a very important plot point is that she actually cared about somebody. Now she no longer gets to be with that somebody. So it sends her either on a path of reclusion for a while or a path of ass kickery. Either way, that's how we developed the Wonder Woman we know in the 80s. For me, it's par for the course with all these comic book movies. Even when they do something right, like that emotional beat in at the end of Wonder Woman, then the next movie they just undo it. So I, I just throw up my hands and, and shrug. I don't know. I don't know what else. How else I'm supposed to react to this? My knee-jerk reaction is yes, it takes away from it because I start to picture myself going back and re-watching the first Wonder Woman. And if I re-watch it and know he survives, that completely changes that moment in the movie. But, again, it's Patty Jenkins, and but, I would like to believe that she had a reason to bring him what back. What if you didn't rewatch it? What, what, like, I like rewatching I, I it. Because I, I never planned to see Wonder Woman ever again. So Did in, you not like, enjoy it? So, it, no? was, it was fine, but it's like Perry said, the, the third act totally collapses. So if I don't plan to rewatch it, uh, which I understand would you know my viewing experience would change knowing what I know now, Meanwhile, is, did, does the first viewing experience change, like, now that I know this? And I don't think that it does. Like, I, I thought that was a good emotional beat. That, you know, the movie is what it is. I think people let, worry less about the emotional experience you had the first time watching a movie and what it actually means for the character going forward. And so it I really do, it does come down to a question. If, if you trust Patty Jenkins or Jeff Johns or whoever is writing the script to, to take care of this character that we knew and we really fell in love, regardless of what you think of the third act, I think a lot of people responded to the character of Wonder Woman and you want to see her in future adventures so the fact that she's not going to have this emotional baggage of knowing this guy that died and what that does to somebody that's what you have to take care of if you're writing the script for Wonder Woman 1984 I just love seeing Steve Trevor at a mall he did not look happy to be there like he's not (laughs) thrilled about being in a mall setting it's just too much it's too quick is he the winter soldier it's quite quite the outfit (laughs) It's uh, a <laughs> he's good. he's the he's the best one. The, the extras are on point. The extras are fantastic. They're on fleek, guys. Yeah, classic 1980s mall hair. And I, we we were gonna go to the Dumbo trailer next. Don't do it yet. I can't. I literally can't focus <laughs> on the show. Yeah, I I need to do the rest of the show, and then we'll talk about the Dumbo trailer because I don't know what's gonna happen to my tear ducts when we talk about that 
freaking elephant. God. So we're going to move on to the next story, and that is the AT&T Time Warner merger has been approved. This is a huge story because way back, it, as early as last year and even before that, we were talking about how, hey, Disney is coming in and might be acquiring 20th Century Fox properties. But if that sale is to go through first, they have to wait to see what happens with AT&T and Time Warner merging. And then Comcast is like, no, 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 we want to buy 20th Century Fox properties. And again, we got to wait and see what happens with this. Well, despite the fact that the U.S. Department of Justice Antitrust Division filed a suit against this merger with AT&T and Time Warner happening, it has gone through, which could open the floodgates for more giant conglomerates merging together as one, like Disney or Comcast, acquiring 20th Century Fox. Comcast has been noted as saying they have the cash to buy right now, and they might want to outbid Disney, who would be using a, a combination of cash and stock options and a number of other things to get 20th Century Fox properties. Let's look at the overall landscape of this, because I know a lot of movie fans love speculating about whether we would get X-Men into the MCU and stuff like that. Just on a, on a bigger scale in the entertainment industry, Perry, when you hear AT&T and Time Warner, these two huge companies are merged and that is kind of the precedent for other companies to maybe follow suit. Where do you sit with that? It's, it's tough to assess. I think right off the bat, the whole idea scares me. And it goes back to the conversations we've had about this potential Disney, Fox, Comcast situation where the second two big operations merge, there's... There's less studios to work with out there. There's less uh, opportunities to have a different creative style with your work. There's less studios to sell your work to. There's less opportunities overall. And I don't like that idea. In reading so much about this merger, when it happened, and how it could change the landscape of Hollywood, the one silver lining that I kind of latched onto and understood, to a degree at least, and there's really no predicting how this is all going to go, but we are in a big period of change just in terms of the rise of streaming services and how powerful they are. And even though we look at studios like, like Disney, Universal, Warner Brothers, and think like, those are the studios, they control everything, we could be on the cusp of streaming services threatening them. And if this merger goes through, and then later on, that gives these studios the chance to survive by maybe merging with, with a Netflix, an Apple, an Amazon Maybe it's for the better, but one way or the other, I think that this merger getting approved, yeah, this is essentially opening the floodgates. It's saying to anybody who has a whole lot of money, if you've got all this money, start thinking about who you want to buy because you're probably allowed to now. Yeah, I mean, you hear Verizon's looking for a big content player. You hear that Google or Apple might be looking and might be in the market to acquire a big Hollywood studio. It's so like Collider. It's it's <laughs> everything is. Hey, we're I, I don't know I don't know if we're for sale. Actually, I just all I know is that I'm gonna cry in about 20 minutes. Um, Jeff, I think that with this, people look at this and they say, Oh no, this is this is the man coming in and taking over everything. Do you look at this the way that Perry is? Is that this is just gonna be less opportunities and there's gonna be less studios? and you're going to have less diversity as far as the way movies get made? Or do you see there's some more silver linings in this? Really, I think we have to talk about what this means for Steve Trevor. I, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, no. I think if you're a, as a reporter, it makes my job a little bit easier because, you know, I think the consolidation means fewer companies to keep an eye on and, and uh, keep tabs on. For a creative in this industry, I don't think it's a good thing. It, it, it does mean less buyers. Um, I don't know that it means fewer opportunities necessarily because, you know, Disney, maybe they're making 20 to 25 movies now. Maybe they're going to make 50 in the future. Uh, so it's the same number of things. But I, I think what will be interesting is, like, where certain projects go. Like, you know, if Fox does go to Disney, do the Fox movies go out through Disney theatrical? Do they go to the Disney streaming service? Uh, does Fox stick around as a label? You know, do, like, Fox Searchlight is a real brand for a certain, you know, art house movie goer. Do they just kill that label? Um, so I'm just curious how it's all going to shake out. Like Perry said, I think it's too early to know, but 
this is just the start of many dominoes to fall. You're going to see Lionsgate. That's going to be a hot target, and maybe even Sony. Sony likes to think of themselves as a buyer, but they could, uh, but they could, you know, very well end up being sold. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the big difference now, as far as before, is that like Lionsgate or whoever it is or Time Warner, now they have somebody else to ultimately answer to, or the high boss there has somebody else at another company to answer to. But as far as the actual companies go, I don't think Fox Searchlight would go anywhere if Disney acquired it. It, it, it might there might be less job opportunities. And I think that the big fear is that when you have two huge powers merge, there are some jobs that get lost in the midst of that, but it doesn't right. mean that those jobs are never going to be there. That, that, that is why it's a bad thing though. Yeah. Yes. Obviously this is going to, there's a lot of overlap um, and a lot of people are going to lose their jobs, unfortunately, but you know, stuff can rise out of those ashes, newer companies, that kind of thing. That's true. New, newer companies or maybe even uh, different arms within one company. Right. So there, there could be that, but Again, in reading all of these reports, I think one of the main things that really made me uncomfortable for everybody involved in this is, you know, you read that this merger goes through and then it's likely that Comcast is going to make their bid official. So then you have all these people who might have heard what their status was within the Disney Fox merger and right. they're, they're making Could plans. Totally they're, change. they're thinking, oh, I'm good. I'm going to go over to Disney or they're making plans to move elsewhere. And all those plans just get torpedoed. And you don't know if your job is safe. You don't know if your job is a duplicate. And that is a terrifying reality to be in that, that your livelihood and potentially a job you truly love could be stripped away or you could keep it. So I, I'm just looking forward to all the cards falling and landing somewhere just so some of these people, a lot of people could have just some sort of peace of mind. And we're talking about a 12 to $14 billion difference too in the bids. Because uh, I think Disney's is like around fifty two or fifty four, mm -hmm. and uh, if you you know if Universal did its all cash bid, that would come at a, a premium, a twenty five percent to thirty percent premium. So they'd be looking at sixty five to sixty eight billion dollars. Yeah, and that's Comcast saying, hey, w w like we literally have the Scrooge McDuck vault right, right here, and Disney's is a mixture of you know it, it's a mixture of cash and probably some gold. I don't know if there's any Bitcoin in there and a lot of stock options and Disney so passes. It's a, yeah, you, <laughs> you get, get to a whole, cut the whole line <laughs> if you work <laughs> at Fox, you get free parking at Disneyland for the rest of your life if Disney does in fact acquire you. So that's some good news. Well, let's go and move on from the big studio talk to a small indie film called Avengers Infinity War. The movie just became the fourth to pass the $2 billion mark at the worldwide box office. This is significant because it's the third movie to do it on its initial run. Avatar is still the all-time breadwinner worldwide, followed by Titanic, then The Force Awakens. However, Titanic, and I didn't know this until this morning, Morning. Titanic actually didn't cross the two billion mark until a re-release. So Titanic, you know, comes out and people get excited. People, I have a friend, Justine Marino, my good friend. She's a comic. She's seen that movie twenty-five times in the theater. Congratulations, oh Justine. God. So then you hours. have. Avengers Infinity War. This is the first movie in the MCU to pass $2 billion worldwide. I know it's just a number, and you'd say, well, do, do you think any less of the movie if it only made $1.8 billion instead of two? But this is a significant watermark for the MCU for no other reason, because now they have a number to shoot for with all their subsequent movies. Now, we know a movie like Ant-Man and the Wasp isn't going to hit $2 billion worldwide. What does this do for the future of the MCU? Does it change their strategy at all? Does it say, hey, we need even more team-ups and we need even more characters in our movies because look at all the money we made with this one? I would be surprised if it changed their strategy at all, but rather just validate it. Clearly, they're doing something right. And I always go back to the idea of we're in this position where it's making $2 billion and we're in this position where people care about seeing all these characters come together because they built such a strong foundation. So if anything, I don't think they're going like, uh-oh, now Ant-Man's not going to compare at all. We should completely just ditch those and just do team-up movies. I think it validates it, and I think it gives them more opportunities to continue to take more risks, step outside the box in the future, because it's not just this monumental success with Avengers Infinity War. Black Panther also crushed it this year, and we're talking about an insane amount of money for both of them. We're talking about making real differences in the industry, especially in terms of Black Panther's case, and we're talking about critical and fan praise across 
the board. People are hyped about Marvel right now. So if anything, I think this is just setting the course for a brighter future. Yeah, Jeff, maybe the real question here is, do you see any hesitancy on Marvel's behalf that they see, or Disney's behalf, that they see what these characters, the culmination of 10 years, and now you make this huge movie that so many people love and has all these characters in at the same time, regardless of what happens at the end of Infinity War, do you see more hesitancy to lose one of their signature characters like an Iron Man or a Captain America because of how popular they are in movies like this. So big reason why this movie made as much as it did. Uh, no, I think Marvel has a, a clear plan. I don't think that the box office grosses are going to affect that. Um, they know that each movie has a different budget and there are different box office expectations for them when you have... How many, how many characters was it? 64 superheroes in Avengers, Avengers Infinity War. Yeah, they're going to expect to cross a billion or the $2 billion mark. Ant-Man, they don't have those same expectations, nor, uh, nor is Ant-Man designed to, to gross those kinds of numbers. Um, so I, I don't think that it'll affect their strategy. I don't think that they'll hesitate to lose an, an actor. A lot of that is really beyond the creative control, too. It has to do with the actor's contract. And a lot of these actors are ready to kind of say goodbye to these characters. Um, you know, Marvel has made them famous and lifted their quotes, and now that they can get higher quotes for other movies. But uh, again, these movies take so long to shoot; it really takes up a good part of their schedule. And I think a lot of them are, are ready to look forward to the next phase of the MCU that maybe doesn't include them. Yeah, Daniel Craig was ready to look beyond the James Bond <laughs> landscape, and then he's like, you know what? Give me fifty million dollars. I know they didn't pay him fifty million dollars for James Bond twenty five, but it's like, you know, yeah, your quote has gone like, up, but if the gross is two billion dollars. Disney's got plenty of money to play with. I, I just feel like, but like Chris Hemsworth is a bigger movie star than than Daniel Craig. Like Daniel Craig, outside of the Bond franchise, I don't really think he works so well. Chris Hemsworth works. Ruffalo works for Chris a certain Hemsworth kind of should movie. work outside the MCU, but he hasn't as far as box office dollars go yet. I agree with you. I saw his ad for the Hugo Boss cologne the other day, and I'm like, why is this guy not the most famous movie star on the planet? D He's got all the goods. See Chris Hemsworth movies. He's better than Liam. <laughs> yeah, I, I just don't know why the 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 gross is having smoke. maybe it's just the quality of the movie but I thought in the heart of the sea was okay I, I thought it was you know? great too but that that movie didn't make a lot of money black hat didn't make a lot of money what, what else a, am I thinking of I where he was just in a lead role I think it's more opportunities well. that I'm talking about like the way that, that Chris mm -hmm. Hemsworth has looked at in town he's he's gonna always have a bunch of projects coming into him and I think he's ready to do more of those um, and I'm not, it's not just Chris Hemsworth, though. It's, it, you, it's Downey Jr. Downey, it's a whole I think, bunch is... Chris Downey, Evans, in particular. Downey's the one that you want to lock up in some way. And I think that Tony Stark mm -hmm. and his technological savvy lends itself to that because he could just become the new Jarvis and he could show like, up, roll up, and do, you know, three hours worth of ADR, then all of a sudden he's in the movie. Here, here's an interesting thing, and I won't get into specifics, but it's like I, I think that you could certainly see Chris Evans go to television the same way Chris Pine just went to television with Patty Jenkins. Right? Chris Pine just did a, a Patty mm -hmm. Jenkins TV series. Mm -hmm. I think you can see Chris Evans going to television. Okay, so Chris Hemsworth was also in 12 Strong, which did... Uh, eh. Did okay. It was a good movie. Did oh it? yeah, that that is the one. Did that okay. I was thinking but about. Chris Hemsworth is also in an untitled Men in Black spinoff, which we now know is it's him and Tessa Thompson, right. Liam Neeson is doing. So th I think that movie is going to do just bad fine times. At that were yeah, a lot of hearing a yeah. lot of good buzz from people who who have actually gotten a, a little peek at that one. And so. then speaking of Chris Pine, he's also going to get to participate in a heavier role in the next Star Trek movie. So Chris Hemsworth, it's all looking good, and he smells great. I haven't smelled the Hugo Boss cologne, but I'm sure it's fantastic. Well, somebody who we think is just fantastic is our own pair. Nemiroff, and she got to sit down with a couple of the cast members from Incredibles Ooh. 2. You saw the movie. I did see Seems the Seems like you really enjoyed it. Just a little bit. Just loved a little it. bit. I loved it. So now we have, uh, is, it, is it Huck Milner? Huck Milner, yeah. And Sarah... Vowel. Sarah, Sarah Vowell. Vowell. Two characters in The Incredibles 2. Perry Nemiroff has an exclusive interview. Here's a quick clip. I wanted to ask you about your experience doing the voice work for the first film compared to this one. Is there anything about that process that has changed over the years? I mean, when I, uh, you know, the first film, I'm not an actor, um, and I got that part originally in the first film because Brad Bird heard one of my documentaries for public radio, so and I had never acted before, and um, I was a little more terrified the first time around, just not knowing how to do that or what the whole thing would be like. And, you know, and that was, um, I guess, nearly... Uh, 
yeah, like 17 years ago. So I have been this character off and on for 17 years. So I am a little more comfortable with being her and, you know, acting. I mean, all of the stuff about her that's like me, you know, her sarcasm and she's a bit of a wise guy and she maybe says truthful things at inopportune moments. All of that was pretty easy, but... Um, you know, public radio is pretty low key, and uh, and certain things about animation have to be literally more animated, and so or there are just things you have to do like scream or make the sound of being hit, and all of that stuff was a real uh, process learning how to deal with that. And I mean, there's one scene in this movie where Violet uh, does a big spit take. Was wondering about that. And um, to rec do that, I basically had to waterboard myself, just like pour all this water down my throat and then after a while I just vomited all over the studio you know <laughs> which is another thing that does not happen in public radio um, but uh, it is a more physical process how'd Brad respond to that everybody was kind of concerned I have to say <laughs> If that happened in this studio ever, I would be highly concerned. Yeah, you know, I, I immediately texted Patton Oswalt, who was uh, Remy and Ratatouille. I was like, I just threw up all over the studio. And he's like, I never vomited once. <laughs> What's harder for you, Huck? Is it getting your lines right or is it doing all of the... What are, what are they? Are they called efforts when you have to do, like, not dialogue, Vokes, but... I think what are they? Vokes? They're called votes. Someone, I mean, someone I told meant, me efforts once. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm guessing it comes from vocalizations. I don't know. That's what they, they call them at Pixar. Is there any one of those that's most challenging for you? Well, um, I like doing the um, vokes because, well, you can just make a sound, but I think I they're more challenging because you have to pretend like that's actually happening to you. You have to pretend like you're, like, uh, if I'm running really fast, I have to be like, oh, oh, like breathing heavy or something. And it, it's sort of harder for me to do that, but at the same time, it's hard for me to do like little, like long lines because I have to say them pretty fast because Dash talks really fast sometimes. All right, that is Perry Nemiroff with Incredibles. To Perry, I am very much excited about seeing the actual movie. That interview just gets me more excited. It was fun bringing everybody like back for, you know, or bringing most of the original cast back to do the voices, but like, you can clearly tell that they're excited about the resurgence of this. It's just different mm -hmm. because this is a sequel. It took a long time to make, but it seems like unlike some other sequels that take over a decade to come to fruition, this one paid off. They should be excited because they made a really good sequel. They used all that time, they used it well, and it's incredible, it's incredible how seamless one goes straight into the other. And I said this in my review, but one of the things that I love most about this movie is the way that the story plays out. It doesn't make me feel the need to be like, oh, well, I like the first one better than the second. It just feels like a very natural, appropriate, a another adventure for this family. And it works really well. Very excited to check it out this weekend. Um, well, sometimes when we're talking about movies, whether it's Justice League or it's Rogue One or the Han Solo movie, there's been multiple directors. There's people that come and go, and you always wonder, well, who's going to get directing credit in the case of the new Queen movie, Bohemian Rhapsody, that comes out this fall? It will, in fact, be Brian Singer. He was the original director on the film and directed the majority of it, however, due to some personal issues and him butting heads with star Rami Malek on set. He was relieved of duty or step down depending on who you believe and Dexter Fletcher who directed Eddie the Eagle was brought in to finish out shooting he directed 16 days the rest was done by Brian Singer so it has been confirmed by producer Graham King that Brian Singer will be the credited director on the movie to quote Graham King he says basically Brian had some personal issues going on he wanted a hiatus the movie to deal with them and the movie had to get finished that is what it came down to it wasn't about reinventing the wheel we needed someone who would have some creative freedom but work inside a box, and Fletcher did us a real favor. So my question here, Jeff Snyder, I'll go to you first, is Brian Singer, clearly there's some controversy surrounding him and his personal life in Hollywood right now. The movie comes out, and it looks to be a frontrunner for an Oscar contending in a number of categories. So you probably, although he deserves credit for directing the movie, you probably soft sell the fact that he is the director of the movie, right? 
Yeah, I don't think that, you know, they're going to, I don't know that you'll see his name on the poster or in ads. I don't know that you'll see him at a bunch of award season Q&As. They'll probably keep him in, in the shadows just a bit uh, in, in order to avoid a, a moment that could go viral, that kind of thing. Um but yeah, he he directed the movie, and and there's always going to be controversy surrounding Brian Singer. But from the point that they hired him to do this movie to the point where he got fired off of it, there was no there were no new allegations about any misconduct. Uh, so it, it's sort of it's two situations that have been conflated by the media. Uh, you know, Brian Singer wanted time off to deal with a, a sick relative. Uh, they couldn't give him that kind of time off, and they moved on. Uh, but he did direct the movie. You know, twelve weeks of shooting uh dexter fletcher came in to do the last 16 days and obviously brian singer did all the work to get it to the point of even putting it into production so he is the director of this movie he is the one who should be credited dexter fletcher simply finished the film the same way joss whedon came in and finished justice league uh you know for Zack snyder who was also dealing with a similar tragedy yeah and brian singer he's the guy's made great movies in his career he's made the usual suspects did the, the x-men movies days of future past is fantastic but he also it, there was a personal hiatus that he wanted to take but he also was butting heads with Rami Malek on set so there's a lot of other things that were going on and when you have all of the things that were going on in Hollywood towards the end of last year that are still continuing to happen then I think that there is going to be things that surface from somebody's past coming out and that's fair game in my opinion Perry with Brian Singer I think it's also fair to give him credit for directing this movie I just don't see the studio doing a big Oscar push for best director like they will for best actor or best picture I would agree with that if this movie comes out and it is indeed a major Oscar contender, they're going to put their financing behind other categories probably and not necessarily him, but the credit is a completely different story. I mean, to me, that is a black and white issue. He directed the movie. He'll get credit. Like Jeff said, you're not going to see his name and lights all over the place, but when the end credits of the movie or the opening credits kick in, it's going to say directed by Brian Singer as it should because he directed the movie. If anything... With his behavior and allegations, if need be, they will have a ripple effect. So yeah. that, that's you, you where just, it's going to come into play, not whether or not he should get a directing You credit. can't erase the fact that, that he directed it, and that's why we have guilds. You know? that, that is why the DGA exists. So. All right. Well, we have a lot of participation in the chat room, most of which is what other 70s era band would you like to see a biopic made out of? So there's a, there's a Led Zeppelin vote in there. There's a David Bowie one. And then there's a Fleetwood Mac one. I give you all those three my, options. My dad wants to see a Randy California movie. <laughs> a Randy California. Do you know who Randy movie? California I've was? I've heard the name and I have no I idea. Think, who I think Randy he California was like is. maybe in the, the group Spirit or it's either Spirit or Triumph, one of those. Triumph but, was a great Canadian but he band. Like, if there was no rush, you'd know more about Triumph. I, I think Randy California has it's, it's some crazy story where like his son like drowned in the ocean, or maybe he went out to go save his son and ended up drowning himself. I, I need the specifics on it, but Randy California, if you're an executive, look that look that whole story up. You're not uh, getting that confused with the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Danny California. No, no, no. Okay, Perry, if I give you a classic rock era band. I'm a kid of the 90s. Give me a break. I'm going to see a Kurt Cobain movie. I'm going to go watch Spice World. <laughs> and where's oh. the En Vogue movie? Goodness. You're taking an entire decade of the 90s and you're I'm, boiling it down to Spice World. I'm still bitter that I couldn't go with some of the Collider crew recently to see an outdoor <laughs> screening of Spice World. Not I'm available you, on DVD or streaming or like anything like that. I guess really? it's on DVD, but on, I you can't s- stream it anywhere. I, I still think. have my VHS tape. I just don't have a VHS player right. to play it with. What were uh, the options, though? The 70s bands? I gave you Zeppelin, I gave you uh, Fleetwood Mac, I gave you David Bowie. Is there another band you want to toss in there? Uh, I mean, but I, think, I, think, I think we're all waiting for Bowie. Yeah. Bowie will get done eventually. We're all waiting for that. Um, and, and I There's they, an Elton John movie they, that's in the works? They cast a guy named Luke Baines, I think, as Bowie in the Fincher uh, HBO series that they, where they pulled the plug. Mm-hmm. Uh, Luke mm-hmm. Baines, he really looks like him. There's one other guy, too, who looks just like David Bowie. I forget his name, though. I'll have to come back to you with that. All right, David Bowie seems to be the vote getter and the winner in the chat room and then also up here at the news desk with us. We move on to our next story, and that is a fun pairing between John Cena and Jackie Chan. They are going to be teaming up for a new movie that was originally going to be Sylvester Stallone and Jackie Chan. When Stallone had to drop out, John Cena jumps in, and it basically is about a Chinese private security contractor who's going to be played 
played by Jackie Chan. He gets called in to extract oil workers when a China-run oil refinery undergoes some attacks in the Middle East. And then who does he team up with? John Cena, a former Marine, to come in and help him out. So it's going to be an action extravaganza. Do you guys see laughs happening in this one, too, like what we got with Rush Hour? Or do you see this more as a straight-action premise? Because Jackie Chan... I haven't seen the movie The Foreigner. I, it, it, it's playing on every plane that I fly on, yep. and I get this close to clicking on it, then I'm like, nah, I'll just watch Almost Famous again or something like that. I've heard The Foreigner isn't good, but I heard Jackie Chan gives a really good dramatic performance in it, so he can do drama or he can do comedy. Very we know he can do action. I, Wh- I what's the tone know, of this movie going to be? I watched The Foreigner last night because looking at the show notes for today, it reminded me, oh, I hadn't seen it, so I put it on last Can't night. Can't you do and less research and just do nothing? <laughs> I... I I had very little to do. I did not leave my apartment <laughs> yesterday. Um, I I liked the movie overall. I thought it was pretty well done, and I thought Jackie Chan was fantastic in it. And it it is very dark. Oh, I mean good. that okay. that is a really dark role and a dark headspace to have to put yourself in. So, having just watched that, and also having liked John Cena's performance in it, it's called The Wall, right, with Aaron mm-hmm. Taylor yeah. Johnson. Having liked his his performance in that, even though I think he's got some really great comedic chops that I want to see more of too it makes me hope that this movie has a more serious tone to it even though you know as you were describing it I'm looking at the the images we have and like there is one of Jackie Chan with a big goofy smile on his face with his arms up and I started to picture what it could look, look like with a more comedic spin but I am hoping they go more serious with this one Yeah, I mean if they had cast Chris Tucker opposite Jackie Chan we know what we're in for here Snyder but you can go either way with John Cena because obviously we know he can do action he's really good he was really funny in blockers too i've got a mixed reaction to this news i love john cena i loved him in blockers and i did like him in the wall and I, this is clearly an upgrade in terms of uh, john cena is a bigger m- movie star these days than sylvester stallone and will drive more people to the box office and etc etc et but i'd be lying if i didn't say that i'd rather see jackie chan and sylvester stallone two action icons because that's who cena is replacing it was supposed to be stallone it is and i think that that I mean, and, and stallone dropped out for probably different reasons but i think the fear with the studio as well as with me personally mm-hmm. is that if you get stallone and jackie chan would i love to see that team up yes how do you get the is kids it, yeah. it runs too much into the expendables territory yeah, where this one that. just could have a different feel entirely there's no question that this is the more commercial version of the movie uh, especially with the way that john cena is popping these days as a movie star but yeah it's really just a selfishly uh, th- this seems like product whereas jackie chan and stallone there's a there's an element of maybe this could be a special okay i don't see this being special um we'll see maybe, i've heard it's called x baghdad too i don't know if it has an official title it, it or does not. not have an official title just yet nor does it have a uh release date so it's going to be from need for speed director scott Waugh, need for speed uh, Rami Malek was in. Dude, yeah, he was. But you know what? I just watched uh, Active Valor recently again. You know, you remember the Navy that movie? Seal movie? Yeah, yeah. That it was, had that actual was, Navy SEALs in dude, it. Dude, that movie's badass. Yes, so it is. you can you can trash Need for Speed all you want, uh, Scott Waugh. I certainly thought he'd be going on to a bigger career than he has had, but you can't take away what he did with Active Valor. No, Need for Speed had some okay action, and Active Valor, obviously. I want all the Navy SEALs that were in Active Valor to be making some sort of appearance. I'd take a sequel to Active Valor in a heartbeat. Yeah, Active Valor's pretty sweet. I'd probably take that too. Both of those movies, though, make me think that this is probably not going the comedic route and even though no, I, I, I think Sly could have gone one way or the other it is more likely that the pairing of the two of them I think might have been a little more dramatic based action than comedic all right let's uh let's rip the band-aid off here um I don't know that I can go see Dumbo I literally don't know that I'm emotionally prepared to handle the Tim Burton live action version of Dumbo that I just saw a teaser trailer for y'all um they put the scene where Dumbo has to say goodbye to his mom the last time he's ever going to see his mom again. It's the scene that rips my heart out every time I watch the Disney version of it. Sometimes you just like to have a good cry, like to have an emotional purge. That's the scene I'll put on when I need it because they're rubbing trunks and, oh, dear God, it's going to happen in the live action version too. I thought maybe Tim Burton would sugarcoat it a little bit. Maybe there'd be like, maybe if you could, prom- if somebody out there could, even if I know that he reunites with his mom by the end of the movie, I still just don't think that I have the emotional makeup to sustain watching this movie. So Perry, I might have to take a pass on this movie. Looks really good. 
I, I can't handle it. There's no way I'm taking a pass on this movie, but I understand where you're coming can't from. Can't do it. Even in this teeny <clears throat> tiny trailer for this movie, just seeing that slight moment of him saying goodbye to his mother, I could feel my heart crumbling and I know what my response is going to be in the actual film. But, you know, with the with the track record they've had with their live action adaptations, I think this has a shot of really being something special. And I know some recent Tim Burton movies haven't been, they haven't had the magic of uh, some of his original things. But you know what? I am just completely captivated by the worlds he creates. And I think that's something that this teaser trailer highlights so, so well, where really the instant it opens and I see those wide shots of that circus, I'm just immediately sucked in. And that's a world that I want to be in. And the way the whole teaser was structured too, it just builds to that moment of seeing Dumbo rise and then fly so beautifully. So, you know what? I might cry all the tears in the world by the end of this movie, but I think I want to suck it up just to see some timber. Yeah, you know what he's happen. flying towards? He's flying towards his mom. You know who's not there? His mom. And I know I'm going to answer all the questions right now. I dressed like this before I knew the Dumbo trailer was a thing. So I know I look like an extra in the movie. I'm not, this is not a Dumbo theme costume today. This is just what I decided to go with today. Jeff Snyder, you saw more footage because you were CinemaCon. Right, they showed you, a little bit more. At that end of the trailer here, are you going to be an emotional puddle of mess like Perry and I? Um, I do have a big heart. I am a big softie you have underneath feelings. this gruff exterior. <laughs> I, I think that, that Perry hit it on the head when she said the, the M word, which is magic. Uh, I think that that is why you're going to see Dumbo, and, and, and that is what this teaser trailer offered. Magic, a sense of wonder. Uh, Tim Burton has not been doing so hot uh, lately, and I think that this is going to be a return to form for him. I have actually never seen any of these live-action Disney reboots. I didn't see Maleficent, I didn't see Cinderella, and I didn't see Beauty and the Beast. This is the first one where I'm pretty sure, sure that I can Book? say... Yes, no, I did see The Jungle oh. Book, and I love The Jungle Book. Uh, you could skip Maleficent. Yeah, so I, I think hopefully that this this does veer closer to the Jungle Book. Yeah, I think I will definitely check this one out. All uh, right, did they show the um, the the scene when Dumbo is losing his mom at CinemaCon? I don't think that they did. Yeah, you know why? Because no. it's an audience full of people, and you don't want to depress the hell out of them. What was right. the reaction like when when it was screened at CinemaCon? Did people go crazy? People really liked it. I, I think that they were excited to see the elephant, uh, Michael Keaton, Danny DeVito, uh, Colin Farrell. I don't know. How, uh, we, did you see? Was there a lot of Keaton in this teaser? No, right. I, I certainly don't think I saw any Keaton. I, don't think, I, I, I forgot he was in the movie. The and idea of him being back with Tim Burton after working together on the Batman movies, that's that's super cool to me. Yeah, if he's going to be a bad guy, and if it's like, if, it, if it's, I might never watch another Michael Keaton movie after uh, this if I, if he's, if he does anything to that elephant, either one of the elephants. Let's try, not, it, the story is not Dumbo here. The story is Dumbo's mom and how cruelly that animal is treated. So let's just make sure we're taking care of Dumbo's mom as well as Dumbo. Thank you, Mr. Burton. I've said my piece, and I'm going to remind you guys that we're going to save some time for your live Twitter questions at the end of this show. So go ahead and start tweeting us right now at Collider Video. Use the hashtag Collider Movie Talk. Hashtag Dumbo's Mom Lives. And I'm also going to remind you guys that we have continuous coverage of E3, the huge video game event in Los Angeles. We have um, we're covering all the latest news and games and announcements and all that good stuff on our channel Collider Games. Perry Nemiroff, you are heading down there later today to team up with Jeremy Johns. I am. I'm, I'm really excited. I was bummed to have missed out on it yesterday, but uh, today I, I am going to go and, you know, we're going to walk the floor, see what it has to offer. We're hopefully going to get to demo some games and you're going to see some coverage of it. So should be good fun. All right. It's going to be good fun. And then later on today, we uh, also are going to have uh, all new heroes episode. And then tomorrow we have a special episode of movie talk. I'm very excited about this. It's, it's going to be done from our podcast studio, which means we're going to be able to take your live phone calls. We're going to tweet out the number to call it in. So follow us at Collider Video on Twitter. Twitter. If you're not already doing it, you'll get the number. Also mention the number when I'm doing the broadcast. Going to have a lot of guests popping in and out. I'm going to be running the ship normal time, so you don't have to change your viewing habits at all. It's going to be streamed on YouTube, 9 a.m. PST, around 9.30 tomorrow. I'm going to be dropping my major Comic-Con announcement. I'm going to be in San Diego Comic-Con doing something fun. I'll announce it around 9.30 a.m. tomorrow. If you're in the San Diego area, do not miss that announcement. And now we move on to our live Twitter questions. And our live Twitter questions, they're just, they're, they're really hitting me hard today. Jay Scott St. Clair kicks off, says, Beyond Dumbo. This is really going to test how big of a heart Jeff Snyder claims to have. It says, Beyond Dumbo, what was the last movie to make you shed a tear? Oh, that's easy. 
I mean, I was bawling my eyes out at the Mr. Rogers documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor. Really? Yeah. Okay. Is it, it are they tears of like joy or is it like a sad ending or like what's. It, it is a sad ending. So, uh, not to spoil the movie, but at, at the end, they basically ask you to think of someone who helped you get to where you are. And they really actually let the moment breathe and give you a full minute to. I closed my eyes uh, and, and just sat there and, and had an experience. And I thought it was absolutely beautiful. I sent my father and he cried. And that's how you know this movie really works. Yeah. It's a, I've met your dad. Yeah, when, uh, he doesn't when, cry at movies. When we had our Schmodown match, and I was dressed remarkably similar to right and now. And he was missing a tooth. Yeah, yeah, he's got a good, <laughs> got a good. Strong, it's back now. He got it. He, he found he, it. He, his tooth grew back. That's good. <laughs> it's nice to know that even if you're uh, Jeff Snyder's dad, the tooth fairy still is fully operational. Uh, Perry Nemeroff, the last movie to make you get emotional. That was my answer. Boom! Stole ju- it from her. I just saw. Uh, <laughs> Won't you be my neighbor? And really? I. That that moment got me, but there were a lot of little things that happened throughout the movie that just build to, and I know this is probably a cliche thing to say at this point because I've heard a lot of people bring it up, but when you say that it is a movie that we need right now, it's just when right. you, because with Mr. Rogers, I grew up watching Mr. Rogers, but I, you know, I watched it as a kid, <laughs> Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and then mm-hmm. I never thought about it again as an adult, and when you when you think about those lessons as an adult, you see all the other layers and you start to apply it to, to your life, to everything that's going on around you. And it, it, it just hits you. It hits you like a truck that we really need to hear these things again. I was quoted on the Patriots Day poster saying this is the movie that we need right now. It probably wasn't. <laughs> this truly is the movie that America needs right now is the Mr. Rogers. I have to give you a little credit with that with Patriots Day because I, like Patriots. I was nervous to walk into that movie. But right. but the amount of inspiration I felt walking out of that one, I, I would say I had a, a, not a, a similar reaction to won't you be my neighbor, but I felt w- how you described it at that time. But, but seriously, Ellis, in terms of crying like this this mr rogers movie there's a track from it called it's called fish beach by michael nyman it was actually part of the the score for man on wire and that is used in the mr rogers documentary and i listened to it driving to work yesterday and i was crying on the way to work just listening to that it's called fish beach fish beach Okay, that sounds like, just like the iTunes. title of like a free music track you download on YouTube. No, nope, it's, it's amazing. Okay, From the man on wires. Fish track. Beach. I'm going in a little skeptical. I just never grew up like. I'll I, play it for you after. We'll dance. I, I'm in. I'm I'm dressed for it. Is it, if it's swinging, let's do it. <laughs> extra, extra. Ellis is gonna cry at the Mr. Rogers documentary. I just never grew up with it. I mean, I knew he was there. And then I, as, as an adult, I'm like, oh, what was, it? was he really a, a sniper? Did he pick up Nazis? And I think he was in the military at some point. <laughs> That's uh, a deleted scene on the DVD. <laughs> is there a post credit scene with Captain America in the Mr. Rogers documentary? Okay, one more question, and this is a good one to close our day out with. Let's get something else away from the emotional tinges of the morning. Alan the Ace says, what would be a good Marvel movie for Van Damme to do? So if you give me Jean-Claude oh. Van Damme. And let's say that you let's say that we're we're rebooting all the MCU movies or all the Marvel movies, and you you have to put Jean Claude Van Damme in there somewhere. Who would you cast? I I, I have not one, but I want to see. I will, I'll let Perry go first. Well, the second you started bringing it up, and before you even got to the recasting thing, maybe it's just because it's sly. But mm-hmm. I picture him somehow. I don't know what the character would be, but somehow fitting in that crew and that universe. And I'm I'm almost like a little dead serious about it. Give him a Ravager. Yeah, the Ravengers? well, not, yeah. A, not a Ravager, but what what are what's uh, Sylvester Stallone's crew called? Oh, they're the, the, the Ravagers. Yeah, they're the Ravagers. Yeah. Yeah. Are they? Oh, she would not okay. have gotten that right on the Schmodown. <laughs> Don't they have like a name in addition I think to that? That's it. No. Aren't they an extension of the Ravagers? So you I don't you know. would want Van Damme? To I be part would want of that him crew. in the gar- in, in the Guardians universe in in that type of role. All right, I have two. Okay, I would say either Red Skull. Ooh, I like that. Or. Mads Mikkelsen's character from Doctor Strange. Really? Yep. Okay. Those are my two choices. You could slap Van Damme into either one of those. All right. Uh, I I could I could take Van Damme in anything. I mean, I, I would literally take him in any role in the MCU. Anything he wants to play. It'd be cool to see Van Damme Hulk out. It'd be really. De- I'd like to see him wear a cape and be Doctor Strange. Um, but I think that if I only had one to pick from, I would I would make Van Damme Hawkeye, and I'll tell you why. Ooh. Because Hawkeye. 
is known for his uh, prowess with that. the bow and arrow. But when you have all these intergalactic species that are coming to Earth, sometimes the medieval defense isn't the best one. And I think that Van Damme can take care of himself in a way that most other uh, marksmen with archery cannot. So he can shoot bow and arrow, but when it gets to close combat, he's not just, he can do a lot of cool stuff. And he can do the splits. And imagine doing the splits like as you're shooting a bow and arrow. Yeah, it'd be sick. I mean, pretty cool. All right. Let's not make it creepy, Mark. Let's <laughs> say good night. Thank you guys for tuning into this episode of Collider Movie Talk. Make sure you check out the Collider Movie Talk feed on your podcast one app, wherever you get podcasts, listen to us, as well as Movie uh, Talk, the after show, after thoughts. That's also there on Movie Talk. And you also get mailbag on the weekends. Whole lot of fun stuff for your ears and not your eyeballs. I guess there's no eyeballs in podcasts. In podcasting. No? You're the eyeball, Mailbag. The eyeballs of your imagination. No? All right. Thanks for swooping in there and rescuing me, guys. Appreciate <laughs> it. You want to make it awkward as we say goodbye? No. Jeff Snyder, where can the kids find you? At the end, Snyder, and always on Collider News. All right. Perry Nemiroff, where can they catch you crying to Dumbo? <laughs> Twitter and Instagram, at P. Nemiroff. I am Mark Ellis. Let's go to the wide, Adam, and say goodbye, everybody. See you tomorrow for our podcast version that you can also watch of Collider Movie Talk. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You want to watch more? Then click up here or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.